This video is sponsored by Mistplay. Rainbow Bright started as an illustration on greeting cards from Hallmark, specifically to compete with the success of Strawberry Shortcake, who also started as a greeting card character. <laughs> Still want to save this Afterward, the 1984 TV series debuted, and this caught on like wildfire. You can find Rainbow Bright on, plastered on literally anything and everything. The story revolves around this little girl in a fantasy world devoid of fun and color. And for some reason, she's super special and is able to bring the full color of the rainbow with her, saving the land from sadness, evil, and all those general no good things. Early designs of Rainbow Bright shows a shock lack of rainbows? She was originally supposed to be someone who could control nature, but was then changed to someone who can control colors. The original design was done by Gigi Santiago, which was most likely the same person who designed a lot of these tchotchkes for that your grandmother was in love with. Rainbow Bright had one of those sudden booms in popularity. It released exactly when it was supposed to, rose to stardom, and then ever since struggled to find its footing in literally every single iteration thus far. First was the 1983 doll, the 18-inch plush doll that came with two variants, the variants being that underneath the skirt her bottom was either red or blue, so technically there's variants, but it's not distinct enough for anyone to really care. Other characters were also available. The 80s era of Rainbow Bright is probably the most successful. They had the toys of every character and several of the sprites. There was a cereal tie-in, a Taco Bell toy tie-in. They wanted to put Rainbow Bright everywhere they could so you couldn't escape. In 1996, there was this attempt at the doll by Up, Up, and Away. She's horrifying, to put it lightly. But that was just the kind of dolls that were like that back then, which came in different clothing variants for what it's worth. It looks very 90s. Sparkle Bright was also available, but finding evidence of that is very difficult. This doll is incredibly rare. This line ended only after a year and wasn't very successful. 2004, ha we had this iteration from Toy Play. A lot of people get this version confused with the original 80s doll since they're very similar. This was made to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Rainbow Bright, so they essentially just remade the original doll from 1984. Easiest way to tell is to look at the smock or her belt where her rainbow sticker is. If it's smack dab in the center, it's the 80s doll. If it's being cut off at the bottom, it's the 2004 doll. The 80s doll rainbow would also fall off a lot while the rainbow on the 2004 doll is sewn on. Finally is the 2009 doll from Playmates. This released just after Christmas, completely missing the holiday season, and was the biggest commercial flop out of all the toy lines. There was also the online-only plush doll that released in 2010 on Toys R Us. This wasn't supposed to be played with, or looked at, or touched. Shout out to Rainbow Bright Net. A lot of this information came from their channel. They have a super in-depth video covering the history of Rainbow Bright dolls. Go check them out if you want more details. In 1984, released the officially licensed animated series lasting 13 episodes. Funny enough, this is this show actually looks more like an anime than a poorly animated 80s cartoon designed to sell toys, and that's because it was actually animated by TMS, Tokyo Movie Shinsha. So Rainbow Bright is technically an anime, and she is tasked to find the Sphere of Light, which will allow her to spread those good vibes and cheer to the people of this world. Tasked with divine purpose, she sets out on her quest, constantly interrupted by mean monsters. I'm trying to find a Sphere of Light. Sphere of Light? My name's Whisk. I'm Twink. His name is Twink? Behold, the origin of our namesake. Fellow Twinks, bow to your progenitor. And as you bow, you should also grab your phone and download Mistplay, the sponsor of this video. Mistplay is a loyalty app for all of us that play mobile games. If you're looking for help covering your morning coffee or your Spotify subscription, by using Mistplay while you play games, you can earn rewards. Mistplay offers a massive catalog of games. Heck, chances are there's games that you're already playing. And you can discover more games to help you earn more rewards. And once you've earned enough points, you can redeem them for gift cards. Everything from Amazon 
Amazon, Walmart, Xbox, PlayStation, and more. There has been over a hundred million dollars in gift cards that's already been redeemed. They even have other ways you can earn rewards, like sweepstakes, whenever you try out a highlighted game. If you're getting bored with what you're currently playing, Mistplay will have a bunch of recommendations. I started playing Empires and Puzzles and Merge Dragons, just to give them a whirl and go outside of what I usually play, and I gotta say, I was pleasantly surprised. If you sign up today, you'll get 200 points just for signing up. And if you use code NEGATIVE50 in-app, you'll also receive an extra 50 points that you can use towards your gift cards. Click the URL in the description or the pinned comment below. Thanks again to Mistplay for sponsoring this video, and now, Back to the video. And in classic surface level anime fashion, she needs to go to the big evil castle, find the demon king, I, I mean, the <clears throat> evil one, and retrieve the special powerful sphere of light to fix all the problems in the world and save the twinks. Every little girl's franchise needs a horse. Horse girls weren't just a thing after spirit released. They've been around since the dawn of horses. And for some reason, it just Dethaws from the magical ice because reasons. You can talk! Talk? I'm Starlight! Oh, this is just as weird as Snarf talking in Thundercats. And they fixed that in the reboot. I hope they fix that in the Rainbow Bright reboots. And these two are the lackeys to the evil one the green Mario ripoff and the dude who looks like a moldy chicken nugget. Get the grunge buggy started! Come back here! I. I cannot believe Murky is voiced by Optimus Prime. <laughs> you might be surprised at the quality of the show, but turns out Hallmark invested a massive amount of time and money into the production of Rainbow Bright, even needing an entirely separate division just for how big this project was. Rainbow Bright didn't accidentally catch on and explode in popularity. Their audience was very specifically researched for their interests, and Rainbow Bright was developed to appeal to their target demographic. Its success is more because of the hard work of the crew that created created Rainbow Bright, rather than having this you know, uncanny appeal to kids of the 80s. Please, you set me here. A baby. What? There's just a random baby abandoned near the river? Well, what a way to introduce a character. While exploring a cave, Rainbow Bright finds her titular color belt. Orbs appear out of the belt and the color kids telephone Wisp, telling her that they're supposed to be helping her. But the evil one banished them to the seven corners of the world. At least that's a better introduction to the other characters than stumbling upon a baby. One of them was literally just a small walk away. I don't think this world is all too big. And it's really not big. They managed to find two more in the same area, so much for, you know, the seven corners of the world. So the show really just focuses on finding the color kids so that Rainbow Bright can unlock all the colors of the rainbow. The colors, the color kids are like minor deities of color in this world, but they need star sprinkles to use their powers. They find all the color kids in one episode and then just beeline straight to the evil one's tower. Like... Wow, already getting to the final boss. And then the baby is the sphere of light because she's got a massive chrome dome. I don't know. I feel like prophecies and oracles could avoid titles and nicknames when they give their prophecies. And with basically no problem, the evil one is wrapped up in sh rainbows and killed color returns. Yippee! Yahoo! That was literally just two episodes and they already won. The magical voice in the sky goes, yo, good job. How about we call you Rainbow Bright? I'll admit, strong start and great hook for a show that's ultimately just supposed to be a, another colorful kids show that's to sell toys. You thought we'd be just focusing on Rainbow Land? <laughs> Think again, because we need a random boy to get isekai That's right, we have Brian. And they feel so bad for puking Skittles onto him that they bring him to Rainbow Land, the first outsider to ever go to Rainbow Land. I can ride a flying horse. I'm almost 11. Dang, he's only 11 and can already ride a flying horse? I'm 26 and haven't even gotten my flying horse license. <sighs> Kids these days grow up too fast. Now the show devolves into the classic goofy lackeys working to do evil bad things, but are too incompetent to actually succeed, which is shockingly common for 80s cartoons. Ah, honestly, it's common in cartoons in general. Heck, Pokemon had this setup. So did I! <laughs>
I take back what I said about them being too incompetent to succeed. All things considered, this is actually a well-constructed show. It feels like it actually has heart in it rather than just being an overly glorified commercials with a surface level plot, which was the majority of cartoons during this time. Maybe that was the big reason this show was so popular. It feels like an actual world. You will pay for drinking me into that bottle. <laughs> Can't you take a joke? It was just a prank, bro. The rainbow. The f the happened rainbow. to your mouth? Rainbow Bright feels like an actual leader. Too often in some shows, the girl or girls are often just pushed aside and not really given actual character. They're reduced to a caricature. Rainbow Bright isn't, which is no doubt because the development team behind Rainbow Bright was entirely female. Funny enough, when it comes to shows aimed at boys, it's usually trying to emulate being more mature or having to deal with more mature topics, and so people usually think boys are more mature, but I would argue it's actually reverse. A lot of guys seem emotionally stunted and take a long time to really grow up, and so their shows are showing them what they don't have. All the while, a lot of girls are forced to grow up faster than boys, which is why a lot of the girl characters are the mature ones. And shows that appeal to girls are typically simpler and focus on more fun, simple, childish plots because they have to grow up so fast, their childhood is even more precious to them since they don't get to be simple and childish like they want to. Wow, that's actually kind of depressing now that I think about it. I know they say she just brings color to the world, but her power is clearly way more powerful than that. They apparently carried over the nature powers, but there's a lot of instances where the star sprinkles can just do whatever they need it to. The best part about this show is that they actually explain why the villain hates color, and it's just because his mom traumatized him after he was just being a kid. He was told he was going to clean off that color if it took the rest of his life. And dang, he took that a little too literally. If you ask me, Rainbow Bright actually holds up pretty well. After the beginning two episodes, it becomes a bit more generic, but it's still quirky and fun. I'd throw this on TV when I wanted to unwind from a long day and just want something on in the background to watch. It's still really cute. Partway through the TV series, a theatrical movie release of Rainbow Bright called The Star Stealer released in 1985, and it focuses on the dark princess, a self-centered bougie bitch that only cares about diamonds and looking pretty. And of course, there is a musical aspect to it because every kid's movie needs to have a musical aspect. Why was that a thing back then? It's very specifically franchise animated movies that think they all need to be musicals. For some reason, it's supposed to be spring, but the winter refuses to leave. Man, remember when the winter wasn't a few days sprinkled between bleeding hot days and it was just steady weather? Huh, I miss when things were normal. So a robot horse crash lands to Rainbow Land, I know it's weird, stick with me, asking about the whereabouts of Rainbow Bright, saying it has a message about Diamond. Uh, apparently the planet Spectra, the Diamond Planet, is in trouble. Yes, this is the first time we've ever heard of the Diamond Planet. The universe will die unless you hurry. So they travel to Spectra, where it looks like they have their own sprites there. They need to find a sprite named Orin. I don't know a lot about Orin, but I hear he has a great host club. The sprites have been ordered to make a massive net that literally covers the entire planet, and also the Sentinels from X-Men are here to stop Rainbow Bright. I didn't know this was a crossover movie. Of course, Murky and Lurky manage to follow them to Spectra. General danger commences. Behold! Boy! This is Chris, and apparently he knows who Oren is. He explains that Oren is locked away, and the Dark Princess is wrapping up the planet because she wants to own Spectra. Not sure how wrapping a net helps, but okay. The accident rate is up, and every country in the world is blaming the whole situation on some other country. Everyone blames it on everyone else. I guess politics haven't really changed all that much from the 80s. Remember Brian? Yeah, apparently he has a key that should go to Rainbow Land, but it doesn't work, so he's really just randomly spliced in the show to show how bad Earth is getting. Just to remind you of the stakes. But we already got a boy in this story, we don't need another one. Go back if you want to! I can do anything you can! Yeah, also, Chris is just sexist. He just 
really hates the fact that Rainbow Bright is a girl, and it's annoying immediately. There's nothing about his character that's really redeemable. I already miss Brian. Anyway, they work their way to the Dark Princess's castle, avoiding traps and the like. They managed to reach the Dark Princess, and their plan was just to chat with her and tell her that she's being naughty. Obviously, she sees Rainbow Bright's belt and says, ooh, gimme, gimme, gimme. They really didn't think this through. Like, did they think they'd be able to just walk up and say, hey, this is bad? Whoa, I never thought of it that way. I guess I'll stop. And they get thrown into a dungeon. And all we have to do is walk in and explain it all to the princess. How dumb can a girl get? Listen, I don't like agreeing with Chris, but I need to agree with Chris. Robot Horse Onyx comes in to save them, and he just brute forces his way in, or at least he tries, and Rainbow decides to be smart and tell him, yeah, piss off and get my, my horse. <laughs> They get the belt back less than three minutes later, and now Rainbow has her super special powers, and Starlight falls to his doom. What a shame. You might have guessed it, but there's actually not a lot that happens in this movie, or more like it's very slow, and most everything they do doesn't really amount to much, so it's nearly the same as nothing happening, and Starlight falls to his doom again. Murky and Lurky are doing nothing important. Starlight actually gets captured. What is awesome about this movie is that the setting is really cool. This is such a stark departure from the TV episodes. It's like the writers remembered that they set up a big world and universe and forgot to do anything with it, and this movie was their excuse to just explore some ideas they had floating around. This is more something I would expect from a Rainbow Bright fan fiction rather than an official movie. So even though it's not very eventful, if you're already a Rainbow Bright fan, this movie must have been awesome. Anyway, Rainbow Bright manages to randomly stumble upon Orin and uses his star sprinkles to fight against the frog monsters. Well, there is one thing we have to do first. What could possibly be more important than saving the universe? Saving my horsey! Now that her godlike powers have returned, she easily swoops in and saves Starlight. And also, Chris is helping too, I guess. Murky tries to form an allegiance with the Dark Princess, and he ends up just lying to her, saying that Rainbow Bright has several powerful belts. Totally, I'm not lying to explain why I've never been able to defeat her before. I swear I'm a good villain, you gotta trust me. Now they gotta sneak back into the castle. We can't forget about how how sad Brian is. Remember Brian? He's still sad. Now time to fight. They gotta work together to overpower the Dark Princess's evil crystal, and then Murky crashes into the throne room, which is kinda convenient. And while the princess was distracted, they break the crystal, which also conveniently destroys everything else because that's just how the world works. And then Murky falls to his doom. The Dark Princess gets away. It's going to crash! And this whole planet will shatter. Why is the light of the universe so fragile? <laughs> That's what my conservative friends say whenever they see a pride flag. Everything is okay now, Brian. Don't worry. We did it all for you. Clearly, you're the most important person on Earth. 2009 rolled around and several failed iterations of Rainbow Bright occurred. And there was really short webisodes to sell new toys that wasn't really a solid show or even had a plot. You would have to go to the Hallmark tie-in website, rainbowbright.net, in order to download them and watch them. Surprisingly, you can still go watch them and download them to this day, but nobody really wants to since they don't really amount to much. This is an equivalent to, like, a garbage mass-produced YouTube kids show to rake in the dead brain views of children that just like pretty colors and can't think yet. This iteration had so little thought put into it that it failed horribly. There was nothing to distinguish it from not only previous iterations of Rainbow Bright, but also nothing to distinguish it from literally any other competitor on the market, any other doll thus far, or any other show, or any anything. It was literally just, hey girls, look, a doll that's about girly things. Ooh, we know you like those. Do you want to buy it? Rainbow Bright is really a character that is a leader. That is one of her most recognizable traits. It would make more sense to give Rainbow Bright the She-Ra and the Princesses of Power treatment, you know, compared to whatever this is. Is that what they did? No. Instead, we got the reboot from Hallmark streaming service Feelin', Feelin', which I didn't even know existed. 
This was supposed to be an attempt to give Rainbow Bright a new coat of paint in order to appeal to a new generation, mimicking the styles of modern cartoons. A talking horse? <laughs> a verbose stallion, thank you. They made Rainbow Bright less of a level-headed, fun-loving leader, and more of a crackhead pick-me girl that wants everyone to think she's cool. Isn't it rad? OMB, oh my bows. Totally forgot to introduce myself. Rude. Brian! <laughs> my new best friend, Brian! They fundamentally changed her character, which already leaves a bad taste in my mouth. It's like they wanted to combine Rainbow Dash and Pinkie Pie into one character and it overloaded her personality. Weirdly enough, this show's villain is actually Stormy, working underneath the Dark Princess, and they're still trying to get rid of all the color, but Stormy is just jealous that Rainbow has a new friend, and that's her entire motivation. And double that, now no one cares about her belt. They want Brian's key. The series is only three episodes long, so if you just have to watch it, then it's easy to catch up on, but the quality isn't that much better than the 2009 webisodes. I think the major problem with the newer incarnations of Rainbow Pride is that the studios behind it just don't really seem to care. And if the people that make it don't care, then the people who buy it or who are being appealed to buy it can sense and feel that they don't care. There's kind of just no passion behind Rainbow Bright anymore. Even if people can't elaborate why something feels bad, we as humans just have this gut reaction when something just is shallow and doesn't have heart or soul put into it. It lacks that human element behind it. The reason why the original 80s IP was so successful is because it had a whole division dedicated to the development of Rainbow Bright and the research into the people that they were appealing it to. They were willing to invest the time and the money to make it good. Not only that, to make it unique. How many times during the 80s did an American company reach out to a Japanese animation studio and say, hey, make this thing for us because we believe in it that much that we're gonna get the best of the best to make the animation for us. Now that's just gone from Rainbow Bright. Everyone thinks it's just a flash in the pan fluke of, and that's why it rose in popularity, cause it just, it was the 80s and that was 80s. And it's very 80s, don't get me wrong. Rainbow Bright is a very 80s show. But the reason it was so popular wasn't just because it was a flash in the pan fluke. Rainbow Bright doesn't not just need to be updated. It needs to be modernized. People need to think beyond the surface level aspects as to what makes this appealing. And they need to make it into something that's wholly unique for a new generation. You need to understand more than just, ah, the kids these days like TikTok dances and Fortnite, which is kind of how like the new Mean Girls movie kind of felt. You need to understand the values of a new generation. You need to understand what's important to them, what they fear and what they want. That's how you that's how you modernize something. You need to integrate that into the show. We see so many times that people think that kids are just dumb and they want bright colors and pfft, here you go. And they just shove it into their face. And when kids aren't dumb, or at least not as dumb as people think they are. People think they're like dogs sometimes. It's kind of weird how these people who make children's media think so little of children. I think Rainbow Bright has a lot of untapped potential and is constantly being given into the wrong hands. And when they find a team that's truly passionate about Rainbow Bright, and they give it to those people, then we'll see a new boom of popularity with Rainbow Bright. Maybe it'll never reach the same stardom that it did in the 80s, but that doesn't mean it, it isn't still a valuable IP. Tell me what you think about Rainbow Bright. Were you a fan of Rainbow Bright when it originally released? Are you a fan of Rainbow Bright now? Do you think, do you think that Rainbow Bright has a second chance at popularity, or do you think it's a thing of the past and it should stay in the past? I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to click the link in the description for to try out Mistplay. Stay beautiful and keep playing.